It's great to be back with you again. I am Dr. Paul Weaver, Associate Professor of Dal- at Dallas Theological Seminary in the Bible Exposition Department and Professor at the Word of Life Global Bible Institute. In today's video, we will be surveying the Gospel of Luke. By way of review, the Gospel of Luke is one of the synoptic Gospels. And the word synoptic comes from two Greek words, the preposition soon and the Greek adjective optic. The preposition soon is translated with or together. And the Greek adjective optic is translated as sight. The Greek verb opsomai also has the same root, which means to see. So synoptic means to see together. And the synoptic gospels, which include Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are books with the same basic outline of events surrounding the life of John the Baptist and then Jesus Christ, and includes similar content. We see them together, or we see similarities in them. Let me share this chart with you again. As you'll see in this chart, 58% of the contents found in the Gospel of Matthew are found in one of the other four Gospels. And only 42% is unique to the Gospel of Matthew. In our last class, we looked at the Gospel of Mark, which has 93% similar or the same material that's found in the other Gospels, leaving only 7% to be unique to the Gospel of Mark. Now, 41% of the contents found in the Gospel of Luke is the same or similar to the other Gospels, while 59% is unique to it. We will highlight some of those unique components in this video. Now, look at this. The Gospel of John has only 8% of its contents similar or the same as the contents found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, leaving 92% of it to be unique. Again, this is one of the reasons we believe that the Gospel of John was written last, because John was aware of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so then John includes details that the other Gospel authors did not. Well, let's now turn our attention to the Gospel of Luke. As we have done in previous videos, we will continue to investigate some of the important historical questions. Who is the author? Who is the recipient or recipients? When was it written? Why was it written? And so let's look at those questions, those W words, those who, what, why, when. Let's start with the author. In future videos, we will study together what we call the Pauline epistles and what we call the general epistles. An epistle is a fancy word for letter. We'll see that the standard procedure when writing a letter in the first century was to include the name of the author in the first couple verses. For example, in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, we read, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle. In Colossians, we read, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. However, it was not the standard practice of including one's name in a gospel account. In fact, none of the four gospels have names attached to the actual writing, which requires us to depend upon other lines of evidence, literary style, early church fathers, and so forth, to establish authorship. The writings of the early church fathers make it abundantly clear that the first century Luke is indeed the author of the gospel that bears his name. Some of these early church fathers include Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Tertullian, Eusebius, and Jerome. Luke is also identified as the author by what is called the Muratorian Canon, around A.D. 180. This is the oldest known list of New Testament books that were regarded as authoritative. So a canon was a list of books that the early church regarded as authoritative. And Luke was identified as the author of the Gospel of Luke in this canon. 
we know that the author of the Gospel of Luke is not Jewish, but rather Gentile. We believe this based upon comments recorded by Paul in the closing words in his epistle to the church of Colossa. This is recorded in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Turn with me there. We read, and I quote, Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. So after Paul lists some of the co-workers in the ministry, he states, these are my Jewish co-workers. Then Paul proceeds to list some of his non-Jewish co-workers, including Epaphras, who is one of you, and a servant of Christ Jesus. He sends his greetings. Now look at verse 14. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. So from this verse, we learn that Luke is not Jewish, but rather a Gentile, and that he is a physician. Now, it's not appropriate to talk about the Gospel of Luke without referring to the book of Acts, because Luke is the author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. In Luke's introduction to the book of Acts, he references his former letter that he wrote. Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 1, verse 1? There Luke writes, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are very closely related. We could even say that the Gospel of Luke is part one and the Gospel of Acts is part two in a two-volume inspired historical account. The Gospel of Luke focuses on the words and works of Jesus Christ, and the book of Acts focuses on the words and the works of the apostles under the leading of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts follows specifically the lives of two apostles, starting with Peter in the early chapters, finishing with Paul in the later chapters. Luke was a co-laborer with Paul. Luke accompanied Paul on several of his ministry trips, including to Rome. There are a lot of sections in the book of Acts that Luke changes the personal pronoun. He speaks from, goes from third person, he and they, to first person plural, we. In Acts chapter 16, verse 10, Luke writes, after he, speaking of Paul, had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. Verse 11, so putting out to sea from, Tro from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace. Verse 12, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we were staying in this city for some days. Now verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we we're supposing that there that we would be a, there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. So Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, includes himself in these traveling accounts as various periods of during various periods of time on these various missionary journeys. So Paul and Luke were co-laborers. Additionally, at the end of several letters Paul wrote, Paul sends his greetings from Timothy. We find this in Colossians 4, verse 14, Philemon, verse 24, and in 2 Timothy 4, 11. This is also significant because uh, Colossians and Philemon were written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment, and 2 Timothy was written near the end of Paul's life during his second Roman imprisonment. So not only did Luke minister with Paul for a substantial period of time during his missionary travels? But Luke was with Paul at the end of the Apostle Paul's life. You can look that up in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. When Paul writes 2 Timothy, expressing that he expects his death to be soon, and at this time it's dangerous to be associated with Paul, you could lose your life 
and others, like Demas, have abandoned Paul. But Luke remains steadfast, even despite the great risk of persecution and death. Well, who is the recipient of the Gospel of Luke? Or recipients? Well, turn with me to Luke chapter 1, verse 1 again. Dr. Luke writes, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of these things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord. With this in mind, since I myself, Luke writing again, have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of these things you have been taught. Now let's read Acts 1-1 again. Remember, he writes, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen. So both of these books, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, are written to Theophilus, and they're both written by Luke. So Theophilus is the recipient of the Gospel of Luke. He is the primary recipient. We do not know a lot about this man, Theophilus. However, as we read, Luke calls him most excellent Theophilus. We can, do, we can deduce a few things from this expression, most excellent Theophilus. First, Theophilus is probably Greek in ethnicity because his name is Greek in origin. It comes from two words. The first word from Theophilus is theos, which means God. And the second word, phileo, which means love. And so when we understand this compound word or compound name, Theophilus, it means lover of God. However, this does not mean he was a Christian or a follower of Yahweh when his parents named him or his family being Christian or followers of Yahweh. This may be a reference to a love of a particular Greek or Greek gods, Greek god or Roman gods. Theophilus was probably a very influential person, perhaps a Roman ruler, and this is what we deduce from what we believe is his title that Luke uses, Most Excellent Theophilus. In fact, a similar title, Most Excellent, is found in Acts chapter 24, verse 3, in reference to Felix, who is a governor in Caesarea. The Apostle Paul stood before Felix and that's recorded in Acts 24, 3. He was stood before Felix as uh, a judge over him. He's called Most Excellent Felix. Now, in Acts 26, 25, Paul also stands before Festus. And Festus was the successor to Felix. Paul stands before Festus as well under judgment. And in this passage, he is called Most Excellent Festus. So although we do not know much about Theophilus, I believe it's safe to say that he was a very important person in the eyes of the government and probably held a position of leadership, warranting a similar title to that of Felix and Festus. It's also possible that Theophilus is a recent convert. And we conclude this, or might deduce this, in light of the reason that Luke gives for writing. We find this reason in Luke chapter 1, verse 4 where Luke indicates that he is recording these events, and I quote, so that you, Theophilus, may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Although Luke recorded it specifically for one particular person, that being Theophilus, God certainly intended it to be a benefit to a much wider Gentile audience, ourselves included. We see that the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Luke, or in the Gospel of Luke, does not go back to Abraham like the Gospel of Matthew does, but goes all the way back to Adam. Remember, the Gospel of Matthew was written to a Jewish audience, and so the genealogy recorded in the early chapters of the Gospel of Matthew goes back to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. The Gospel of Luke, however, was written to Theophilus, not a Jewish person, but rather a Greek, 
and, in, and intended by God for a wider Gentile audience, and therefore provides a genealogy that goes beyond Abraham all the way back to Adam, who happens to be the father of the human race, Jews and Gentiles alike. The terms that Luke uses are very familiar to a Gentile audience. For example, instead of rabbi, which would be a Jewish term, Luke uses the term teacher. Also, he speaks of Calvary rather than Golgotha. Not only does he use familiar or familiar Gentile terms, but he quotes from the Septuagint. Now, you may or may not know that the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Septuagint, by this time, is already being used uh, by the early church, and certainly Luke quotes from it. Rather than paraphrasing the Hebrew, Luke goes right back to the Greek using the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Additionally, it's helpful to know that the dates for Christ's birth are given in the terms of Roman emperors, again, identifying a Gentile audience. And finally, Luke also includes and emphasizes various individual Gentiles who come to faith in Christ. This reminds Theophilus specifically and Gentiles in general that God has a plan, has always had a plan to include the Gentile nations. And all of this points to a Gentile audience. So we have established that the authorship, Luke, and the recipients, Theophilus, now let's establish the date in which the book was written. We have established that the book of Acts is the second inspired historical account recorded by Luke, and we have established that the first inspired historical account is the Gospel of Luke. So if we have a way to establish the date of the book of Acts, we can then work backwards to know when the soonest that the Gospel of Luke could have been written. So let's do that. As we study the biblical record and the life of Paul, it becomes apparent that Paul was imprisoned in Rome twice. After his first Roman imprisonment, Paul is then released. He continues to minister and preach the gospel. Later, he is rearrested and taken to Rome again. This is what we call or refer to as his second Roman imprisonment. Paul will eventually be killed during this his second Roman imprisonment, under the rulership of Nero. So back to the book of Acts. When we read the book of Acts, we find out that at the end of it, Paul is still in prison. This is Paul's first Roman imprisonment. We can confidently date Paul's first Roman imprisonment to about A.D. 60 to 62. So if the book of Acts is written while Paul is still in prison, A.D. 60 to 62, his first Roman imprisonment, and he has not yet been released, that gives us a very fixed date for when the book of Acts was written, approximately then, around A.D. 60 to 62. Paul has not yet been released. Paul is still in prison at the end of the book of Acts. And since we know that the Gospel of Luke was written before the book of Acts, we know that the Gospel of Luke must have been written before A.D. 60 to 62. It seems evident that Luke was also aware of other historical accounts that had been written before his Gospel. We see that in Luke chapter 1, verse 4. Would you look with me, beginning in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1? Luke writes, and I quote, "...inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. This may be a reference to the Gospels of Matthew and Mark that Luke knew had already been written, Matthew written to a Jewish audience and Mark to a Roman audience, but this likely is also a reference to other non-inspired records that have been written down, but God chose not to preserve? Imagine with me, if you were literate, and you knew how to read and write in the first century, uh, which not everyone did, and if you had the means to purchase papyri, an early form of paper, which was very expensive, but 
for the sake of argument, imagine you had you were literate and you had the means to purchase paper. And you were in the crowds who saw Jesus heal the blind, saw Jesus raise the lame, saw Jesus heal the mutes, saw Jesus cast out demons. And if you witnessed these amazing authoritative sermons that he preached, don't you think you would have written it down for your family, for your friends, to benefit your children? I think I would have. Anyhow, there were other accounts written down at the time that Luke writes, but they were not inspired by God. They were not without error, as the inspired Gospels are in the original manuscripts, and they were not preserved for us today. In other words, they did not survive antiquity, the ancient world. They turned to dust, which is what happens to paper over time. Now, Let's talk about a suggested date. A suggested date for the writing of the book of Luke is A.D. 58 to 60, sometime before the book of Acts was written, but probably not a lot of time has transpired between the completion of the book of Luke and the beginning of the book of Acts, as he records these events for the same person, that being Theophilus. Well, how about the location where Luke wrote the gospel that bears his name? Many locations have been suggested by various scholars as to the place from where Luke wrote, including Caesarea, others say Alexandria, Egypt, some Rome, others Greece. Jerome indicates that Luke was in Achaia when he wrote this gospel. Achaia, here on the map you can see, is the southern region of modern-day Greece. Jerome also indicates that Luke was in Rome when writing the second part of his two-volume work, the book of Acts. Let's consider some literary details. We know that the Gospel of Luke is a carefully researched and documented history. Luke indicates that he carefully researched this material. We read that in chapter 1, verse 2 beginning this quote now, just as they were handed down to us by those who from first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So Luke references eyewitnesses who handed information down to him. However, that was not sufficient enough for this careful researcher. Luke continues to write, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Luke points out that he has carefully investigated these sources. He didn't just accept what was handed down, but he carefully investigated from the beginning these events, including a genealogy, which would probably have been found in the temple itself. The temple would have had genealogical records that Luke, and anyone else for that matter, could have verified. They could have verified that Jesus had the right lineage expected of the Messiah and prophesied about in the Old Testament. The Gospel of Luke includes many unique parables, 18 to 20, depending on how you define a parable. The Gospel of Luke emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit. This is evident not only in the book of Acts, but also in the Gospel of Luke. Additionally, scholars believe the book of Luke has the most refined Greek. The quality of Greek in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts is better than any New Testament book equal to that of the book of Hebrews. Let's consider the theme. The theme that I have given to the book or to the Gospel of Luke is Jesus Christ is the perfect Son of Man and the Savior of all men. Let's discuss the purpose for Luke's writing. As discussed earlier, Luke's purpose for writing is found in verse 4. Luke writes that he recorded a detailed and orderly account surrounding the life, words, and works of Jesus, and I quote, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Luke records these events surrounding the words and works of Jesus for the benefit of Theophilus to strengthen his faith. Now, if we consider God's purpose for this gospel that extends beyond Theophilus to the Gentile world, we could say the purpose is twofold. The gospel of Luke demonstrates to a Gentile audience that the teaching concerning Jesus Christ has a historical basis. Luke is a historian. Luke is concerned with historical facts. He's not interested in adding legendary material 
or mythical stories. He's not going to write like the Gnostics who share these stories that did not actually occur. Luke is a historian concerned with facts and reality. His gospel also demonstrates that. The Gospel of Luke demonstrates that Jesus is Christ, is the Christ, and he came to be the Savior of all men, both Jews and Gentiles alike. And although Jesus is Jewish, and although Jesus fulfilled the Messianic promises prophesied by the Old Testament prophets, he came to save Gentiles as well. Look with me in Luke chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Here we find a key verse that helps us understand the message of the book of Luke. In this passage, Jesus is speaking to Zacchaeus. And we read, Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came, why? To seek and to save that which was lost. So a good message statement for the Gospel of Luke is the following. Because the teaching concerning the life and ministry of Jesus Christ is historically accurate, it demonstrates that Jesus of Nazareth is the Savior of all mankind, Jews and Gentiles alike. Let me say that again. Because the teaching concerning the life and ministry of Jesus Christ is historically accurate, it demonstrates that he is the Savior of all mankind, Jews and Gentiles alike. For the remainder of our time in this video, let's look at some of the unique contributions that the book of Luke provides that the other gospel accounts do not. We will specifically discuss three areas, narratives, teachings, and parables. There are some very significant narratives that Luke provides to which we are indebted. Almost every Christmas, we turn to the gospel of Luke for what? The infancy narratives, chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 52. In Luke, chapter, in Luke chapters 1 and 2, Luke provides the greatest detail surrounding the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus. These chapters also include Jesus' presentation in the temple, which occurred eight days after his birth, and his interaction with the teachers of the law in the temple when he was only 12 years old. All of this is included in the Luke, Gospel of Luke, not in the other Gospel accounts. It's not surprising that the physician Luke is particularly interested in and records for us how Jesus, the God-man, fully God and fully human, is born and grows in wisdom and in favor with God and man. Another story that is recounted often by us today, only found in the Gospel of Luke, is the miraculous catch of fish found in chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. This capture of fish was done by the disciples, and it was after a long night of unsuccessful fishing. Jesus tells them to put their net out, and they obeyed somewhat reluctantly and caught a massive load of fish, so much so that the weight of the fish causes the boat to begin to sink. Another event recorded only in the Gospel of Luke is the resurrecting of a widow's son. That's found in chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. Luke certainly recorded this event to show that Jesus is no ordinary man, but the God-man who has the power over death. It's also interesting that Luke includes the account of the woman who washes Jesus' feet with her tears. That's found in chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. This is not found in Matthew or Mark's accounts. The Gospel of Luke also references the women who accompany and financially support Jesus and his disciples, a unique detail that's not found in Matthew or Mark's Gospels. It also mentions the sending out of the 72 in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. These 72 would go into the cities that Jesus would come to eventually and prepare for his arrival and his message. The Gospel of Luke also includes the interaction that Jesus has with Mary and Martha. It's found in chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. It's in this dialogue that Jesus encourages Martha to be like Mary and to sit and listen to the teachings of Jesus. 
Luke also includes the healing of a crippled woman on the Sabbath, chapter 13, verses 10 to 13. He also includes the healing of a man with leprosy on the Sabbath, chapter 14. He includes the healing of a Samaritan leper, chapter 17. The Gospel of Luke also records a story that we today recount often, and that is the conversion story of Zacchaeus. Luke records the account of Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem. And only the Gospel of Luke records Pilate sending Jesus to Herod to be questioned. Luke also records an event rarely told how Jesus instructed some women along his journey to Golgotha. You can find that in chapter 23. Only Luke records Jesus' detailed interaction with the repentant and mocking thieves, chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. And finally, only Luke records Jesus' post-resurrection appearance to two men on the road to Emmaus, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Not only does the Gospel of Luke include narratives that are unique to his gospel, it also records teachings of Jesus found only in the Gospel of Luke. And these teachings are recorded in chapters 12 to 14 and chapter 22. They include a warning against greed, teaching on suffering not linked to sinful behavior, teaching on the cost of discipleship, instructing his disciples to carry a purse and a sword. There are also several parables that are recorded by Luke that are not found in any other gospel account. Several parables that are repeated often today and are some of our favorites. Parables that have a profound impact upon millions of Christians down through the years. We won't discuss all of them. They are on your screen and in your notes. I do want to highlight a few of them, though. You might be surprised to find that only Luke records the parable of the Good Samaritan. This parable is shared by Jesus after Jesus commands, uh, after Jesus commands them to love their neighbors as they love themselves. Jesus is then asked, well, who is my neighbor? The parable of the Good Samaritan is used by Jesus to instruct everyone is our neighbor and we need to minister to anyone and everyone we can. The prodigal son is another story that resonates with many and recounted often in churches and Sunday schools, where we are likened to a prodigal son, and God is likened to the loving father who unconditionally loves his son, who longs to see his son to return. And when his son finally does return, the man forgives his son and welcomes him back with open arms. The story of the rich man and Lazarus is also unique to Luke. Many consider this story to be a parable. Because of that, I have listed it here. But it is probably an actual historical event that takes place, and not just a story. The reason being, no other parable gives the name of the characters in the story. In this story, a man is named Lazarus. And so I do believe that it is probably not a parable, but a historical event. Nonetheless, this event gives us a glimpse into the afterlife before the resurrection of Christ. And so before the resurrection of Christ, the afterlife, it describes the temporary dwelling place of the dead, known as Hades. The Old Testament term was Sheol. Lazarus was in an area of Hades known as paradise, but the rich man was in an area characterized by conscious and unquenching torment. Remember, this is before Christ dies, and before his resurrection. Later in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, Paul informs us that to be absent from the body, as believers, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In other words, to die, when we die, we are present with the Lord. So how do we make sense of this? Prior to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, those who were believers in Yahweh, when they died, they went to a temporary dwelling place, one called paradise. But when Christ rose from the grave, he made it possible for believers who were in a temporary paradise to be taken with Christ to heaven. Because of Christ's death, because of Christ's substitutionary atonement, these Old Testament saints could be taken to be in the presence of God. And so today, when someone dies, 
you or I, if a believer dies, they can immediately enter into the presence of God because of Christ's substitutionary atonement. Now concerning the dead, those who are unbelievers. Those who are unbelievers, and when they die, they go to a temporary place for the dead. They're still in conscious and unquenching torment. The book of Revelation in chapter 20, verse 14, tells us that at the end of the millennium, Hades, which is the name for the temporary place for the dead, is thrown into the lake of fire. In other words, the temporary place of torment and punishment is thrown into the eternal place of unquenchable pain, unquenchable pain and torment. This historical account, this short historical account, that of the rich man and Lazarus, provides us with some significant theology, a better understanding as it relates to the temporary dwelling place of the dead, Hades, as well as the nature of Hades and the lake of fire, one of conscious and unquenchable torment. Well, when I was young, I always wondered why God chose to include four Gospels rather than just one. I no longer wonder that, because I've come to see and appreciate the incredible contribution that each one has provided as we get a better understanding of the words and works of the God-man, Christ Jesus. Imagine if Luke was not preserved for us by God. What incredible narratives, incredible parables, and teachings that the church would be without. I hope that our short survey of the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have caused you to have a greater appreciation for each of them and the contribution that they have in our understanding of Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal God. I wish God's blessing upon you as you continue to study this incredible book, as you seek the endless riches of wisdom it provides, and as you apply that incredible wisdom to your own lives. And as you do that, I trust that you will become more conformed into the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless.